politics, mystery, deception, romance, action, it's got it all. Welcome back to Dead Good Book Reviews, I'm Judith and today I'm bringing you a review of M.A. Carrick's the Mask of Mirrors, which is the first book in a new fantasy series, The Rook and the Rose. Some quick disclaimers before we start, I was sent a free digital review copy of this book from the publisher via NetGalley, no one's paying me to talk about books, I'm pretty sure I have a physical review copy coming as well, but it has not arrived yet, it may be at my workplace. Regardless of where the books come from, nobody's paying me to talk about books, all opinions are my own. I should also say I am making this review in December, the book is not out till January, if there's any information I need to update you on, it will all be in the description or a pinned comment below. I'm also going to keep this spoiler free as ever, but if you want to go in knowing absolutely nothing, please do click away now. The Mask of Mirrors, as I say, is the start of a new fantasy series. It is out in the UK from Orbit Books on January the 21st, and it is written by M.A. Carrick, an author who is in fact two authors. One of them is Marie Brennan, who has written the memoirs of Lady Trent, Turning Darkness into Light, some of my favourites, and Alec Helms, who has written... Uh, the Adventures of Mr. Mystic. You may know that I love Mary Brennan and everything that she writes. I have not read anything by Alec Helms before, I do not think, but I am certainly interested now. The Mask of Mirrors follows a young woman called Wren who escapes her home where she's part of kind of a, a knot, which is a small crime gang. But the book begins with Wren returning to the city she left. She has one goal in mind, to impersonate the daughter of a long lost relation of one of the noble families, all in order to take their money and set up a good life for herself and her friend Tess. But upon realising that the family's wealth and status may not be all she thought it might be, Wren gets caught up in a net of politics far bigger than she'd ever imagined. Politics, mystery, deception, romance, action, it's got it all. I thought that the characters in this story were great, I really loved reading from Wren's perspective, I think I'm a little bit maybe biased in that. I always love to read from the deceiver's perspective because I like to know everything. One thing that I thought was handled really well was this idea of balancing how often Red is the smartest woman in the room. Too often in books like this I feel like the main character is either unrealistically ahead of everyone else and just knows everything despite things that they might not be able to know, or the rug gets pulled out from them at every opportunity and they just seem stupid. In this case I think what makes Ren avoid those pitfalls is that she's a very adaptable character and as she learns new information she changes the plan. Alongside Ren we have her friend slash found sister, she's also her maid in the context of the deception, Tess. And at first I thought we weren't going to get enough of Tess and I was going to be annoyed about it, but Tess definitely comes into her own in the second half of the story which bodes well for future books in the series. I also love Tess because she's a seamstress. So Tess is in charge of creating the wardrobe that helps solidify the identity of Ren in society. We'll come on to that in a bit. There are other characters whose viewpoints you see throughout the book, which I think works especially because as a reader you know a lot of things before other people know them and you know what other people know, whereas if it was just from Ren's perspective I think things would be a lot more confusing and it would all feel a bit more chaotic. For someone who likes to know absolutely everything all of the time, it definitely suited me. I think it's worth noting here that in the kind of afterward acknowledgements of the book, they mentioned that this, these characters and this idea came out of a tabletop campaign they were playing. And I think that goes some way to explaining why the story is told in the way that it is, because I don't know if you've ever played a tabletop, but you tend to know more about the plot than your character actually knows. And I think that overarching sense of the story as a bunch of different parts coming together comes through in that format. I thought the setting was really good, I loved the Venetian style setting, that's how my brain interpreted the book anyway. I, I couldn't tell you if it's actually meant to be Venice but that's how it felt to me. While you don't get loads of the bigger world building like geography or international politics or anything, the detail that goes into the building of the smaller parts of this world is really significant. I've mentioned that a big part of this book is Tess making the costumes for Ren or the outfits, they're not really costumes, but on top of that every character's outfits and why they are wearing what they're wearing is really well thought out and really beautifully described on the page. If you are someone who likes descriptions of a gown this is a book for you. On top of that you get really beautiful descriptions of the rooms in these opulent houses and you get a real sense of the personality of the characters within their surroundings. The book does a really good job of conveying the contrast between the, these opulent houses and the poverty of parts of the city uh, and what I thought was really interesting about that is that a lot of the book deals with the fact that this wealthy family is seeing themselves as not wealthy anymore and not having the resources and Ren's there going 
but we can observe that this is not poverty. You still have this house, you still have all of these things, you are just relatively poor compared to the other noble elite. Just in general, all these beautiful descriptions really create atmosphere, and as we all know, atmosphere is one of my favourite, most important things in a book. One of the other things I really loved about the setting that these authors have created is, I mentioned it in a vlog, that at one point in the story she's sat in a cafe having dinner with a person and they just say, oh, a nice noble woman like you uh, must be here looking for a husband or a wife. And it just was a lovely moment of world building queer characters into your story when your main characters are not queer and you're not writing that kind of a story. Just knowing that that was something that was acknowledged that was possible and completely fine within this world was super, super duper awesome and I really, really enjoyed it. When I'm asking for representation in books that are not being specifically marketed as LGBT plus fantasy, that's what I'm talking about. I don't need 300 pages of faux gay angst. I just want an acknowledgement that people exist. This book has a great plot. I've mentioned before I love a con woman story. Anything with a long con, oh, it's great. Um, but this book also has politics, it has mystery, it has action, it has not thriller elements, probably, that's not the right word. I'm just thinking of a fourth one. Uh, romance, that's in there too. In some instances that can feel like a little bit too much, and I'll come on to that in a moment, but I do think the fact that this book encompasses quite a wide number of elements means it could have quite universal appeal. Like if you're not so fussed about the con aspect of it, you might really like the politics. If it weren't so long, I think it would make a really good book club book. I just don't think that you can make everyone in a book club read 600 plus pages, uh, but I think you'd get a lot of really different discussions and people would find different things that they really latched onto in the book. But it is long. Clocking in, I haven't seen a copy, but I believe it's meant to be 627 pages in paperback. Uh, it's, it's quite long. When I was initially reading this book, I was wondering why they hadn't split it into two, because there's a point in the reading where it would make quite a good ending. I think it's kind of that classic case of there's a lot to build up in this series, and we don't want to do just a whole book of world building with no plot in it. What I did find interesting is looking back at my notes, almost all the qualms and criticisms I had when I was reading the first half were answered in the second half. So for example, I thought that wasn't going to be enough Tess, and then she featured a lot more in the second half. I just thought that was interesting. My other thing to mention, and this is a personal one that's come up fairly often, so if you're new here you won't know this, but I really struggle with names, uh, family names, if there's a lot of different named things happening, my brain does not take names in. So just a tip, you might want to jot down a few of the key players and just one fact about them right at the beginning of reading, if that's something you struggle with. If you're fine with that then you won't have this problem. But I did have the problem that I thought that two characters were in fact one character and got very confused as to why one person seemed to be self-sabotaging quite so extremely. <laughs> this is again not a, really a negative, but I think it's interesting the level of fantasy in the book really amps up towards the end. It's not quite like some other things where it's not fantasy until like the last hundred pages and then it's full on witches and wizards. It's fantasy throughout, there's a magic system in there, but I think the degree to which magic affects the goings on of the book, she says, trying not to spoil it, definitely gets more increased as the book goes on. So so it does kind of feel like it shifts from a political book into more of a big epic fantasy kind of moment. I don't mean epic fantasy as in the genre, but the moments are epic and it is a fantasy. You know what I mean. I tend to prefer a bit more of a consistent tone in my reading. This wasn't completely bothersome, but I think it adds to that sense of this feeling like two very distinct halves of a book but I don't think that's going to be the case in later books in the series, so I'm not too bothered by it. Some comparisons, some other things you might want to read, some fantasy mystery, City of Lies, I recommend it all the time. It's very, very good, I enjoy it greatly, go for it. This has been compared to V. Schwab, I think probably intentionally towards the Shades of Magic side of things, and that kind of various viewpoints action taking place within a city, that's very much the feel of it. And actually thinking about it, that ramping up of magic as the books go on, um, that's a similar feeling as well. Should you read this? If you're up for a longer fantasy read, I say go for it. Obviously it's not ridiculously long, it's fairly standard for big old fantasy. But I would say go for it, I had a really good time and I definitely want to read it again. This is definitely a series that I'm excited to see where it goes. I think it's got a lot of potential to go in a million different directions and I think it'll be really interesting seeing which path they take. Yes, do the thing. Thank you so much for watching, I hope this was interesting, educational, uh, informative, all of the above. <laughs> Comment below with other fantasy books that feature cons or heists or other kind of deception, I'm always interested in reading those. 
while you're commenting you can follow me on my social media that's linked below you can subscribe because it makes me feel loved and appreciated that's all from me and i will see you in the next one it's gonna be some bloopers now chaos and if my stomach could stop rumbling we'd all have a lovely merry christmas <laughs>